The following interview was, was conducted with Harold E. Amsutz, Professor Emeritus of Veterinary Clinical Sciences for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, April 8, 2009, in his office in Lynn Hall. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Dr. Amsutz, and thank you well, for this thank opportunity. You. Let's tell, start with, tell us where you were born and your siblings and your years. Okay, I was... Um, born uh, on my maternal grandmother's farm in Tuscarawas County, uh, near Bars Mill, Ohio, on June 21st, 1919. And uh, my father's name was Nelson D. Amstutz, and my mother's name was Viola E. Schnitzer, S-C-H-N-I-T-Z-E-R. She, of course, accepted the name Amstutz when she married. and. Uh, I had uh, uh, three sisters. I was the uh, second uh, child and of course the only son in the family and uh, we lived on a farm and sons were kind of important back then. So I, uh, I worked uh, on the farm. Uh, I, I, we moved to that farm when I was two years old and uh, I grew up on a 120 acre livestock and crop growing farm. What sort of what crops did you have? We, I, we worked with, uh, uh, we bred uh, horses, Belgian horses, and dairy cattle, and pigs, and we grew corn, and uh, uh, wheat was our cash crop. We sold the wheat, and we, we grew oats to feed to the animals, and, uh, and we had hay, alfalfa hay, of course. Good, okay. Where'd you go? Tell about grade school and then high school. Tell us a little bit about that. <clears throat> well, that was uh, a little different. I went to a one-room uh, country school with eight grades, and uh, in one room. One room, and uh, uh, we had various teachers. I remember the first one was a Mennonite minister, and I was a little bit scared of him because we weren't of the Mennonite faith, and. Uh, and the teachers would last about two years there or so. And uh, my last teacher was kind of special. Uh, she was a 20-year-old uh, uh, girl that uh, had those eight classes in one room. And uh, I contacted her back in 1990. It was almost 60 years after uh, we had her as our teacher. And she helped me a great deal. And I... Uh, enjoyed that that time and uh, we used to play uh, baseball and uh, and do uh, ice hockey and uh, also do some field hockey and she would take her car and take all nine of us in a cheap little sedan car i'm surprised that all, all of us we'd go to surrounding schools and play uh, play baseball against them it was an interesting time very good so there were only nine people in the uh whole school nine or ten no there were there were uh, as many as four, 40 40 to 50. Boy, that's a big challenge yeah it really was yeah that was, that was something well, special uh, yeah I would say so <laughs> trying to teach all eight grades and then wow <laughs> well I got up early in the morning to milk the cows and feed the animals and walked a mile to school regardless of the weather I, I think I used to tell my grandkids it was about a mile and a half and one time uh, the school still stands and they uh, said let's let's check that uh, mile it's just how far it was it was well it was only it was really a scant mile to be honest about it <laughs> <laughs> the statistics <laughs> <laughs> then I went to um, high school at Orville Ohio that's a uh, kind of a a bad uh, word here because Bob Knight graduated from or Orville High School too. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> I uh, would uh, get up in the morning and uh, my father would haul milk into the uh, uh, company in the morning and I'd get a ride to school and that, that really was two and a half miles to uh, high school. And, it was up to me to get home in the evening, however I could make it. If I could bum ride with someone, fine. We didn't have buses at the time, or I could uh, could walk it. And uh, so I, I did whatever I could, and uh, was anxious that I it was very much uh, in favor 
of my father my, that I get there as soon as I could because there was always work to do when I got home. And uh, it uh, was uh, kept me from doing any sports of any kind. I wasn't tall enough to play basketball, my, you know, had enough talent, but uh, I started playing tennis at an early age. In fact, I uh, set up a tennis court uh, at home and I, uh, I got involved in playing tennis and I, I still play tennis and do it, do it now. A couple of years ago, I was uh, uh, the uh, gold medal uh, senior games champion, eight, 80 and above. And I have to tell the whole story in that uh, I discouraged everyone but one. The night before we were supposed to play our match, he called and said, Harold, I hear you've been playing pretty well. I'm not playing all that well. Congratulations on winning the gold medal. <laughs> That's really good. Oh, dear. How large was the high school? How many students about? We have right at 100 in the, in okay. the grade. Yeah. And there were four, four grades? Four, four grades, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And then what, then it came college? Where did you go to college? I stayed at home a year, planning on uh, farming with my father. And uh, it was, I took vocational agriculture in high school. And my ag teacher insisted I go to college. He pushed that I should go. And uh, after a year, I, I went to college. And uh, well, I probably should say before I went there, after the year of uh, working with my father at home, my father and mother and I sat down at the kitchen table and uh, uh, decided how much money I would get after that year. And, uh, and they told me, I pounded on the table and said, that's not enough. And dad said, that's right. And I was here first. So uh, I went away to college and uh, went to Ohio State, of course, and uh, had, uh, uh, I thought, uh, good, Good time there. I first um, enrolled in a uh, national youth administration program, and I I got the, a, a job of, uh, at, in the dairy barn, and uh, I also uh, helped us establish co-op housing there, in which uh, we uh, would do some of the work in the house, and we'd have a house mother, and uh, we'd. Uh, do a lot, prepare it, help to prepare the meals, and uh, do do the do our own housekeeping and so forth. And uh, it was a, a cheap setup as far as housing is concerned. Sure. And uh, then uh, this uh, dairy barn job uh, improved, and I got a better job. And at first, I was just cleaning cleaning up the milk room and so forth. And then I got a job of milking the cows, and uh, that improved the. Um, uh, the salary, and uh, I also got a room in the dairy barn free, and uh, that was in the haymow. They were set up for students to, uh, they, they were just a bare, bare room, of course, but uh, it worked very well. I could drink all the milk I wanted, of course, and uh, I enjoyed enjoyed that and profited from it. And uh, right. I uh, became a member of the Liveside Judging Team at Ohio State, which was, to me, quite an accomplishment. and. Uh, Got to travel around the uh, the country to other uh, to farms and to uh, other schools where we'd have judging contests and uh, one at the Kansas City Royal Livestock Show I was eighth high college student in, in judging of the whole United States that would participate in that and I was kind of proud of that of course. This is all while you were a student. Yeah. Wonderful. And yeah. I. Uh, what did you go by bus? Oh yeah, well no, we drove cars. Oh. The, the coach would take the, the car and have one of us students drive too. We'd have two cars. Mm -hmm. There were five of us on the judging team. Great and experience. It was a wonderful experience. And uh, I became a vice president of the Animal Science Club and uh, obtained a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture in 1942 and was admitted to veterinary school. Uh, Immediately today, people fuss about getting into school. Uh, at the time, I went over to see the dean, and uh, in a, in a couple of weeks, I was sitting in a veterinary class, which was <laughs> kind of special at the time. <laughs> Boy, you, that's a whiz, whiz admission, right? <laughs> it was. To, uh, <laughs> the, the vet school uh, was a three-year program, and uh, they took us into the. Um, 
medical administrative corps. They took in into the service is what amounts to during the war, you see, and they mm -hmm. had uh, dentists and medical students and veterinary students. They wanted those professional people to uh, stay in school. So in three years I graduated and uh, I was drafted into the military service right after I graduated and was a, a meat and dairy inspector for 10 months. So I was. But uh, where where did that take place? Where did you? Uh, I I went to Camp Crowder, Missouri, okay. where I uh, uh, worked there, and they sent me to Springfield, Missouri, to actually I took my basic training there at Camp Crowder, and then they they sent me to this other thing, and mm -hmm. they sent, sent me there as a, and I ended up as a PFC both times, of course, as a PFC in the military at school, and and then in the at Camp Crowder, and uh, I uh, got a, uh, a uh, certificate of acceptability from the U.S. Army in 1951 as a, uh, ca a captain in the veterinary corps. <laughs> Boy, we're moving up the ranks there. You know, <laughs> you're speedy. <laughs> By that time, I was mar <coughs> married and the Korean War was on, and I... Uh, I was at Ohio State University t at the time, so I uh, didn't uh, didn't uh, accept it. Right. Where did you meet your wife? You had to tell us. Well, you meet your my, I am um, a, a student. Student. Uh, I was uh, at Ohio State at the time, and a student was the same age as I was actually, and he was dating a girl in uh, the Union City. Uh, on the borderline of Ohio, Ohio and Indiana, and he invited me to go out there uh, rabbit hunting uh, uh, with him, and uh, he said, well, the rabbits don't run at night, so we might as well set you up as a date. I have a school teacher over here that I know that uh, I think you ought to meet, so I met her in a year we were, in fact, a little bit less than a year, we were married, so Very that's nice. how I met her. Very nice, yeah. And, uh, I got, uh, the, uh, oh, then as far as my career is concerned, uh, uh, I think I, I had you were, you were, Before you came to, uh, to Career Pat, you were at uh, Ohio State. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, well, what I did after I got out of the service, actually, I went back to Orville and established a veterinary practice there. And what, large or small? <coughs> No, it's large, predominantly large, but I accepted small animals, but it's predominantly large. My old vocational agriculture teacher, who I stayed in touch with, uh, was looking for someone to teach agriculture on the job training to returning veterans, and uh, they gave me a job along with that, so I did that along with my veterinary practice, and I had purchased a, uh, uh, a bull calf. When I graduated from college, rather than... Uh, owing uh, 100,000 or whatever students owe. I had enough money that I bought two Holstein heifers and put them home on the farm and also bought this high caliber bull and he had matured and I so I uh, uh, set up an artificial insemination ring. I collected his semen and uh, our bred cows artificially in the area. So, so I was busy. On the cutting edge. Yeah, if I... Uh, didn't have anything to do. I helped work on the farm, which I wouldn't, wasn't very often. I sure. stayed at home, of course. I wasn't married at the time, uh -huh. and uh, I, I taught that thing. And uh, at Ohio State? Uh, no, that at that was when I was at Orville, Ohio. Oh, okay. I went okay. back to to Orville, Ohio, okay. and stayed there with my parents actually, since I wasn't married. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, in uh, a, a year after I got there, Ohio State uh, called. And uh, they offered me a job as a, a ambulatory clinician, where I'd uh, haul students out through the country and uh, take large animal calls and teach them how to conduct a country practice. And uh, I think the reason I did that or got that call was that uh, I, uh, I I was uh, uh, interested in large animal practice. And I learned to know the the ambulatory clinic operator who became head of clinics uh, after I left there uh, to go to service. And uh, uh, he, when I was his student, uh, 
uh, he'd even send me out on calls, which wasn't legal at the time. I wasn't a veterinarian, but he he took enough. Uh, he respected your respect company. Respect to what I knew and so forth. And uh, one time he was attempting to uh, deliver a calf in the clinic. Some of the veterinarian had sent there. And they couldn't deliver the calf, and he was he had tried to deliver it, and he had trouble with it, and he decided that he had the cow was such that he had to destroy her, and he called for a, called someone to get the medication to destroy her, and I foolishly asked him, would you mind if I'd examine the cow? And he said, no, go ahead. I did, and I foolishly said, hey, I think I can deliver that calf. And I delivered it, <laughs> well, like, <laughs> lived and everything was fine, and uh, I impressed him, so he wanted me to come back and, and do that job. And I Very nice. I was happy with that That worked out nicely for you. It really did. Sure. And uh, I uh, gradually, uh, uh, and I did that work for for uh, about seven, seven years, seven to eight years, and uh, then it was, I went there as an instructor, but I got there in 1947. In 1952, I became an assistant professor. In 1956, I became an associate professor. In 1950, no, 1954, I became an associate professor. In 1956, I became professor and head of the Department of Veterinary Medicine, which was one of six departments in the veterinary school. So Very nice. I, I moved along rapidly. I, I qu qu moved into the clinic, of course, uh, after seven years out in the field and uh, worked in there. Well, then in 1961, Purdue University called me, and the, the, uh, the veterinary school had the first, the, their first class was in the, ready to begin the third year of the curriculum. Because it opened in 1959. Yeah. And okay. uh, so uh, I came over and talked to them and uh, was e even interviewed by uh, President Hubdy. And I, I enjoyed President Hubdy. He, he was a great guy, I thought. And uh, he, uh, in the interview, he asked me what I thought of university architecture. And I, I uh, didn't know anything about architecture. I made some noncommittal remark and he said, we call it early penitentiary, bricks and windows. <laughs> <laughs> he was colorful. Yeah, yeah. I, I enjoyed him. Yeah. They, well, I turned him down, and they gave me that offer. I went home and thought about it, uh, and uh, it didn't change my mind. And uh, after after several weeks, they called and asked me to come back. And I came back, and by that time, they. Rather than just offering me a job in the clinics, they offered me the head of clinics, the head of veterinary clinics, and uh, I accepted that. It was too good to turn down. Sure. And, uh, who, was, who was the head? Was Erskine Morris the head at that time? No. Oh. He, he, well, no, wait a minute. Yes, Erskine, Erskine was. That's he was right. the, because the original one yeah. had passed away yeah. just before the yeah. school opened. Okay. John, well, no. Oh. Hutch, Hutch, yeah, Hutchings had passed away. All right. Well, John Bullard was the head of clinics, and... Uh, when I first, when I was first employed, and then when I they actually employed me, why well, they put him as an associate dean, and I got his job. And John Bullard was a very helpful person for me, also. Right. And uh, at the, at the Purdue, I became uh, uh, enjoyed the headship, and uh, uh, in 1975, uh, I uh, was relieved of some of my. Uh, uh, administrative duties by uh, Jack Stockton. I uh, well, had always been able to satisfy everyone I ever worked for, but it didn't quite satisfy him apparently, and so I was removed from some of my administrative duties. But uh, when uh, the next, uh, when Hugh Lewis came in, he put me put me back in some of those jobs, administrative jobs, and I uh, enjoyed Hugh Lewis has enjoyed working for him right. very much. I think back up a little bit. When you took over, did you uh, did the department grow and oh, were yes, you involved with that? Oh yes, it grew rapidly. My where were you? That was Lynn Lynn Hall when I, the extension was not built, was it? Were no, you in the older building, mm -hmm. the original building? Okay, sorry. No, no and uh, it, uh, my my job uh, at Purdue, uh, of course, was uh, teach large animal 
medicine, and uh, I taught veterinary ethics and the practice administration for quite a few years, and uh, I developed uh, the ambulatory, helped to develop the ambulatory clinic practice in the area since I worked on the ambulatory clinic. Sure. Right. And uh, I t take great pride in uh, be when I before I actually took the job over here. I had the opportunity to employ an ambulatory clinician. I employed Dr. James Callahan, who uh, was a, one of my favorite students at Ohio State, and uh, he uh, came here as ambulatory clinician at the same time that I came then as a head of clinics. And he uh, did a great deal to develop our practice in the area and was a, a wonderful uh, ambulatory clinician. He died several years ago. It's kind of interesting. Uh, I t we have a great athlete at West Lafayette uh, at, uh, that's, that's doing quite well here in sports. And uh, I tell people, well, I really recruited that guy. I, uh, I recruited his grandfather uh, back uh, 40, 50 years ago. <laughs> well, small world, right? <laughs> and, uh, Jim Callahan was Matt Lancaster's uh, Grandfather, of course. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you had a lot of challenges then when you and when, um, let's talk a little bit. Also, you're going to tell us about your research that you were been involved in okay. over time. Go ahead. <clears throat> All right. Well, I've been uh, involved in uh, research uh, here at Purdue with with uh, calf diseases. And uh, just a minute, let me pull that out here. Okay. So <clears throat> I don't do. And uh, I worked with stray voltage. I was one of the first people that really did very much in the study of stray voltage on farms, where it's a, uh, we've had been, I got involved in a lot of legal cases. At one time, I had right at 20. 20 legal cases around the country, and uh, I became a so-called expert in uh, determining For the researchers, we want to just clarify what that term, stray voltage? Yes. Go mm -hmm. ahead, and make yes. a comment on that so they can understand and what I it is. Traveled around the country on, in legal cases, and uh, it was an interesting uh, life, something that I had never expected to do, to be involved in Right. Are the stra cases. strays or the animals that are, is that what you're talking about? Stray voltage? Yes, refers it would to the affect the animals. So they claimed uh, that uh, animals, dairy cattle, would get shocked and wouldn't uh, let down their milk, and uh, they'd have trouble getting pregnant, and they, they wouldn't eat properly and wouldn't gain properly, and so there were many uh, legal cases uh, uh, came up. Uh, there's one, one case even where they claimed that uh, a stallion and uh, uh, a male didn't have normal testicles and uh, was a cryptorch in one testicle retained in the body rather than the scrotum. And, and, the, uh, and uh, uh, a male pig didn't develop normal testicles and they, they made a lot of a lot of claims. Some wow. of them were justified and others not, of course. Right. Those are big challenges. You know. they, they truly were. Right. Just getting the documentation and being able to give it. <clears throat> yes, it was. Uh, and I did some research on calf diseases uh, and uh, use, the use of various medicaments on uh, curing calf diseases and helping them. And, uh, okay. I'm not finding my research. Did you do some international travel too? Oh yes, I uh, I became. Well, 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 <coughs> became uh, uh, a uh, secretary treasurer of the American Association of Bovine Practitioners back in 1967. And uh, I uh, traveled around uh, the country and made uh, a lot of uh, uh, talks uh, to various groups. And uh, I, I worked in that job uh, until 1993. That's a long time. And uh, event when I 
eventually, it was my when I retired, it was my full time job, and uh, they they paid me about as much money as Purdue University was paying me. Uh, so I got to travel around the United States, and as a result of that, I became involved in the World Association for Bouyatrics, which means it's the cloven-footed animals. And I became vice president, and uh, let me pull that up here. Honorary president, correct? Was that what it was? Mm -hmm. The World Association? World Association. I became vice president and then president of mm -hmm. the organization. And uh, I traveled around the world in that, that job and uh, enjoyed doing that for uh, about a, a total of Twelve years. Okay. <clears throat> well, I was vice president of the World Association for Bioethics, nineteen sixty-six to nineteen seventy-two, and became president in nineteen seventy-two, and was president through nineteen eighty-four. In 1984, I was uh, made honorary president of the organization. Very nice. And uh, I uh, enjoyed doing that. Uh, I, uh, I, I worked with cattle lameness a great deal and published quite a bit on that. Uh, so I, w I worked with, with cattle lameness and calf diseases and stray voltage. And I uh, gave general talks on uh, the uh, uh, cattle diseases. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, I uh, have uh, talked, uh, given talks throughout the United States and uh, in the World Association for Boiatrix Meetings. I also had was advisor to quite a few uh, graduate students. Uh, uh, have one, Om Prakash Gautam, for instance, became uh, dean of a uh, Indian Veterinary College, uh, and uh, uh, one of them uh, became Associate Dean of Ohio State, and another an Associate Dean of the Virginia Polytechnic Institute, and uh, another one the Director of the Veterinary Clinic Hospital at Ohio State University. Well, I also worked on dehorning dairy cattle, and at one time, uh, uh, they took pride, like the Ayrshire breed took pride in having long horns in the cattle, and oftentimes they injured each other and could injure a person, of course, also. And uh, then we started grouping, getting larger herds and getting more cattle together and putting them in, in, in uh, loose housing, and they'd injure each other. And uh, so I pop devised and popularized humane dehorning procedures that are used in many parts of the country and did quite a bit of writing on that uh, uh, that I thought uh, would help the cattle industry a great mm -hmm, deal. Mm -hmm. You're good. I also worked on bovine respiratory diseases uh, and uh, published on that uh, extensively. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that okay, that takes yeah, care of that, that, the rest um, of that. I think the um, deans that you served under, a couple of comments, Urs Morris in Stockton and then mm -hmm. Hugh Lewis, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And then Alan Rebar. Uh, Alan Rebar. And, and Willie Reed then. And Willie Reed. Right. The, he uh, had been here before. Oh, yes, he'd factor. been here as a student. And I, Knew him and he's doing an excellent job. Right. I, have, uh, I, I met I've met him. Yeah, I did, and we've interviewed him too as well in the program. Well, yes, I, we I have. Applaud the little job he's doing here. It's yeah, been a very pleasure personal. to work with him. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, were you ever a faculty fellow? Uh, in any of the, 
uh, residence halls at all? Well, I, I, I worked on staff benefits committee. Oh, okay. All right. That's yeah. a university committee. But you know what the Fat Fellow program is, that they work, uh, you get to interact with the students, and oftentimes you can have go over there and have meals with them. But now it's a little bit no, different. No, I haven't been involved. How did he start that? But now with the centralization of a lot of the residence halls not being, or the, the dining courts and dining halls are sort of separate, so it's a little bit different, whereas before you could go over and the students would be there and you could meet them. And so, so, but it's a nice program, and they used to have, uh, they have, been, they used to have winter whispers, and then at Halloween, I'm a fat fellow at Tarkington. They have judging of the floors, and they like the fat fellows to go over and have a look. And some of them are very creative. <laughs> I can imagine so. Yeah. Well, I worked with Omega Tau Sigma. I got the National Gamma Award from uh, the Ohio State chapter in 1961 and 1980. I got the same award from the Purdue Omega Tau Sigma Professional Veterinary. Fraternity. Yeah, I enjoyed working with students and, and that kind of an aspect. Right. Yeah, that's very good. Let's uh, let's see the um, look. Talk, let's talk about some of your awards and honors. One of the ones is that Amstutt Williams Award from the American Association of Bovine Practice, and you were the first recipient. Yes. Well, I uh, uh, so while I was working with the American Association of Bovine Practitioners, of course. Uh, I was responsible for quite a few of the things that were was accomplished there. They had uh, there was about 200 members and uh, uh, so, so had I don't know a couple of thousand, two or three thousand dollars in the budget, and uh, I uh, worked with them. And uh, when I retired, why it was 5,000 members and many of them from the United States and Canada and some from around the world, of course. And I, uh, as a reward, they n made the Amstutz Williams Award, and uh, uh, Williams was our editor, and uh, the, I was the first recipient, and uh, he was the second recipient, of course, and uh, it was a, he's from Oklahoma State, and he was a great person to work with, and I uh, enjoyed him tremendously. How did you find out about it? Did they surprise, was it a surprise? Well, it was a surprise. I sometimes ask people that, and they say, well... Of, of course, of. it was sort of a surprise in the, in many ways. I worked with that organization. I right. wasn't a member, and I wasn't at the meeting, and I was uh, uh, elected secretary treasury of the organization. <laughs> See, when you don't show up, you get an office. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I got started with them. Yeah. And then they awarded me that uh, Amsterdam Williams Award, and uh, it uh, was a... Uh, I don't know. I don't have a picture here with a a, a bull, and oh. a, a wood carved bull. And, uh, it was a nice, uh, nice award to, to sure. receive. And you got from the alumni faculty award for excellence from the School of Vet Medicine. Yes. Yes. And I, I think this is a nice one too as well. The twelfth International Veterinary Congress Award from the American Veterinary Medical Association. Yes, that was good. Good to receive that, as far as I was concerned. That came through my work with the World Association for Boiatrics, of course. And uh, that uh, was a very nice award. All right. And another one was that external, the ex external council of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. You were a participant at the first meeting. I, yeah. I, just, well, I was asked down there as a, more or less of a, a consultant, I guess you'd say. Okay. Wor worked with them. Mm -hmm. No, that's nice. And you mentioned your professional association, and you're a charter diplomat for the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. That was an interesting uh, uh, thing for me to do. The, I think I have something here on that. Uh, Something on that too. The internal, the um, veterinary internal medicine. The, the veterinary spe special organization uh, have been relatively new in the profession uh, co compared to human uh, medicine, and uh, I uh, was uh, the president of the American Association of Veterinary Clinicians. And uh, 
I uh, thought maybe it was time to do something about uh, veterinary medicine. And uh, we had uh, the pathologists had specialized and the surgeons had specialized, and the veterinary surgeons. And I uh, uh, thought that there, there was a need for uh, other specialties. And uh, I uh, thought that uh, we, sh we should do something about it, and a, a fellow by the name of Dale Sorensen from Minnesota and, and I headed up this thing, and we got talking with uh, different people, thinking there was a need for specialty groups, and uh, we uh, uh, got it organized and went to the specialty uh, committee of the American Veterinary Medical Association. They turned us down. They didn't think we were ready for that. And I stewed about it for a year and got back together again. And we uh, went back in. And this time, they uh, not only approved us, but made us a, a uh, overall, uh, uh, we'll that ring. And uh, we uh, were an umbrella group for a cardiologists, a neurologist, and the uh, cardiologist, neurologist, and uh, another group too. I was trying to think what the other group was, but there were three groups that, that uh, we were the umbrella group for them. And uh, that thing has grown to a very large uh, specialty organization now, with the, particularly the medicine group and the cardiologists and neurologists and, der and dermatologists also. And they've all profited. And, was was good to have, to have that thing come to fruition. Sure, yeah. just a little bit extra work is what it was needed yeah. in your expertise. <laughs> well, I, I was the uh, first uh, uh, pre president and the the uh, chairman of the board administration of that association. Yes. Uh, Okay. So I f felt that I had uh, accomplished something in get getting that organization sure. going. Very good. Okay. Let's see. Uh, what about your talk a little bit about your retirement activities? When did you retire from Purdue? Okay. I retired in 1989 when I was 70 years old. Did you had you been on um, halftime before that? Or? No. no. Okay. Uh, wasn't. Uh, uh, I. Uh, since I retired, I, uh, I've uh, helped to teach a course on problem solving applications integration uh, for uh, to first year veterinary students, six hours per week for two months, and uh, did that, and served on the veterinary admissions committee for thirty some years here. I've been on that committee, and uh, another the associate dean and I, uh, for for many years, have uh, looked at all the applications applications and uh, g given our opinion on their academic uh, uh, success that the students had had. And we value such things as the uh, number of uh, cor difficult courses they'd taken, what school they went to, and their overall uh, academic mm -hmm. accomplishments. Uh, ha have the numbers of uh, applications increased over time? Oh, yes. Uh, uh -huh. Students are applying to more schools, and then some of them apply to, uh, oh, maybe even 16 or 18 wow. schools rather than uh, one or two. And uh, we have uh, about uh, roughly 100 applicants from Indiana, and, uh, and we'll have about 800 students uh, apply, and the other 700 are from other states or uh -huh. even other countries. All right. And, uh, we've worked with that, uh, and uh, I've also been in Kiwanis, uh, I've enjoyed the Kiwanis group, and I've uh, been, uh, I've reviewed uh, manuscripts for the uh, professional publications of the American uh, Veterinary Medical Association, and I still work with the American uh, Association of Bovine Practitioners. We give uh, 20 $2,000 scholarships per year to veterinary students who have an interest in food animal practice, which is my specialty. 
and I worked with, with uh, that committee in uh, selecting the recipients. I go to their annual conference and, and uh, present awards and serve as a meeting consultant back through the years. Mm -hmm. Been That's active in the church and finance committee and that sort of thing. And work out at the recreational sports center. Uh, Three days a week, so sounds like a very busy schedule. <laughs> so that's the thing, the type of thing. I, oh, I do gardening. I do gardening, as I, t I mentioned earlier. I play tennis. So you got uh, a, a pretty lo long list there, <laughs> which is uh, good. I keep my wife happy by uh, helping her with meals and baking our bread and things like that. So <laughs> I'm going to give you a call for the bread. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, how about a, um, do you have a favorite, uh, a Purdue tradition that uh, comes to mind? Yes, I think that uh, the uh, Christmas show would, would would be one that I, I would select. Mm -hmm. That, that I is nice. I think that's been special for me. Right, yeah. How about an outstanding event? Well, marrying my wife and our, the birth of our four children, I right. think those are the activities. Did any of your children go to Purdue? I wanted each one of them to go away for, for, for one year or so to break away from here, and not a darn one of them came back. <laughs> they took you up on that, huh? <laughs> oh. No, they were happy with the school they went to. Sure. Didn't want to, you didn't want to come back. No. Yeah, well, that's okay. Now, any uh, topics you want to return to or any closing comments and looking at the vet over your long span? Oh, I should mention that I chaired the committee that came up with the the, the uh, uh, sculptures in front of the Meyer School. Oh, I worked good. with that for five years, and uh, I uh, have uh, this is not for publication yet, I guess. But uh, Hugh Lewis uh, has given us uh, some money on that, and. Uh, he said that uh, this uh, sculpture, they're going to do some things for it to, due to Am and Amstutz needs recognition for his leadership and perseverance without which the completion of the sculpture would not have been possible. And uh, I wouldn't have done publish that uh, yet, anything that, that, that we're right now. Well, I should tell you, I'm working on the, on the, uh, Committee for Dog Days of Summer that's uh, going Gotta to be held in the this, this summer Good. as uh, uh, the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Veterinary School and the 100th anniversary of the Greater Lafayette Art Museum's founding. Uh, I'm working with that and uh, we'll, uh, we had, I had fun, I'm not a, an artist, but uh, it's been fun work talking to the artists and working with them. Right, yes. Uh, I, it, it sounds like a very nice thing because there's been well, a couple of articles in the local paper about yes. it. All right. Well, well, that's very good. It's been, been a, a nice nice thing to do. Uh, well, this continuum out front, our sculpture, has been widely acclaimed in veterinary circles nationally and internationally. And, uh, as you, we're, we're using that uh, on a lot of our stationery and all, all right, sorts yeah. of things. How did the, uh, for the researchers... Was it difficult in selecting the person that did that, or did you get well, leads? I, we sent out the uh, offers to people of uh, what, what we were looking for and uh, sending information to them. Sure. And uh, Larry Anderson from uh, Washington, <coughs> excuse my <coughs> voice, state was uh, a, uh, uh, one of the outstanding people we had. We had worked with 18 people, and nearly all of them were from the United States. We had very few from outside the United States, and we selected him, and he uh, was a great public relations man to help us develop this thing and uh, help us raise some money to get along. And he was just, uh, by, uh, by things he said and what was coming along initially, all we were going to have out there was some kind of a sign saying this was School of Veterinary Medicine. There was nothing about anything like this at all, and then some people suggested one animal or whatever, and now you can see what we have out there, a number of animals and the people with test tubes uh, having to do with research and 
the, the prehistoric cave wall with prehistoric animals cut out in it, and then modern animals coming out the front, and then the, the drumping uh, dog and the boy pointing out the future. So this uh, depicts man's relationship with animals right. from prehistoric right. through modern to, to future times. And it's, uh, I think that we just looked out on what we have. There. Right. And Did you have a look at it when it was before it came? Did you go out there? To no, go I never, never saw it. We saw it. He sent pictures occasionally. That's okay. But I, no, they, they just have uh, well, they, quite a few pictures of it coming sure. here and loading it from the truck and so forth. Right. That was a long, they came, it came by truck, didn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. And just to see it finally was really great, I bet. Oh, it was. It was <laughs> That's when Dr. Baring was the president. When he oh, yes. Yeah. Right. Well, and I, now wait a minute, Don, no, Bering Was it Bering? Had, Bering was here, but he had, Oh, so it was, Do oh, Dr. Yeah, it was on when it came, Dr. okay. Rebar. Okay. Yeah, that was, All right, okay. so you served under Dr. Hovde, Hansen, Hicks, Bering, and Chesky, mm -hmm. and, and Dr. Cordova. Yeah. yeah. Over a Be long span. I liked Bering very well. He and I could see, uh, he, we had correspondence with various, on various subjects from time to time. Yes. Very personable. He, he really was. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Any other special comments that uh, you, you'd like to share? No, I guess not. Uh, it's been a, been a great life here. I am grateful that I'm, I'll be 90 years old in, uh, on June 21st, 19, 2009, which is, uh, you know, thank God for my good health and uh, being careful what I eat. And, uh, what Keep I playing tennis. I, I, I'm not playing much tennis. I'll, I, I, I still hit balls over at the co-rec gym and the racket courts, and they play That's an okay. occasional match. But I don't belong with to any group now. So sure. I, I Just keep your say that I play that much I, anymore. I hit tennis balls, but as far as really playing, I have one artificial knee, and have the other one that hurts me, and I think that. Uh, I'm going to. I don't know if you can hear that knock yet, but uh, it's, <laughs> it, I'm thinking about having having that done. But uh, right now, I I'm not. I, I play occasional play doubles. I don't move fast enough to play singles. They okay. they, they beat me too often. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dr. Ansis, I want to thank you very much for this interview for the program, and we really appreciate it. Thank you well, again. Thank you. <clears throat>